Hello, and welcome to our Surge Experience Online. It is a joy to have you join us today and an honor to share our ministry with you. We pray you will be blessed by the worship, the message, and the ministry. If you are new to Surge, we want to welcome you. Please log on to our website at surgechurch.tv and complete the online connect card that you will find on the main graphic of the homepage. It will be a privilege to connect with you and to be a part of your spiritual growth. As we gather together today, let's join in worship, receive God's word in faith, and stay connected in spirit. Get ready because the Surge Experience starts now. Good morning, Surge Church. Are you ready to worship this morning? Come on, here we go.
believe that this morning. Come on, let's give Jesus a big shout of praise. Hallelujah. Well, are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Oh, that's three or four of you. Are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Hallelujah. We're so glad you're here. It's always a privilege to be in the house of God. Amen. Are you ready to say our, our declaration this morning? Let's make a declaration to the Lord. Come on, let's say this. I will experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower me to live beyond my limits. I receive a surge of faith, healing, resources, peace, hope, favor, and promotion to the next level. I am advancing and not backing up. I am a blessing to my church and to my fellow believers as we surge forward together. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap for that this morning. Amen. Through the dead of night, see the kingdom burst in the color at the speed of light. My freedom is shaking of the atmosphere. Yeah. As the shadows fade into nothing, as the day appears. Come on, let's sing this. Beyond the skies above. Love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, see His praises forever. Waking up to kingdom come. Yeah. See the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. Oh yeah, now forever lifted up from death to life. Oh, there's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless light. Yeah. Beyond the sky.
many of you know that's where your help comes from this morning? Come on. Come on, just give him a big shout of praise right now. Come on, can you do that? Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord.
She's going to lead a song this morning. Is that all right?
Hallelujah, hallelujah, good morning, good morning, Surge Church family. It is good to see you this morning. Feel free to have a seat for a second. I'm going to share a brief, encouraging thoughts about your giving today. In Genesis 8:22, after Noah has found solid ground again, and the Lord's promise to him, he says, while the earth remains... Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. And I started thinking to myself, I said, I said, you've got opposites, you've got comparisons there. And God is telling us that you get a real appreciation for one once you've experienced the other. In this heat, how many of us have walked out of this heat and into a building with air conditioning and said, Hallelujah, yes, Amen, Lord. thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> How many of us on the, the long, dark days in December have said, Lord, I can't wait for the days to get longer again? I'm going to tell you, put that in your seed time and harvest. Say, Lord, I want to appreciate the harvest that I know is coming to me. So here is my seed, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Here's my seed. Here's my, here's my faith with it. And then God took it one step further. He said, he said, well, what control do you have over the days and nights? 
Anybody here have any control over the days and nights? Not me. Uh, seasons, winter, summer. Can somebody control the weather and make it change for us out there? But you know what you can control? You can control seed time and harvest. That's good. You can control the seed that you sow into the good ground, into That's the good. good ground. In Galatians 6, 9, Paul said, Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Right. I'm going to tell you that our church body has been faithful in this pandemic. When there was a time for a lot of people could lose heart, we, Surge Church, are not losing heart. Amen. We are being faithful. And I want you to anticipate. I want you to call on God to reward your faithfulness, to reward your strength, because due season is coming. This pandemic was only a season. And the next season, the greater season, the harvest season is coming. Amen. We just thank you, Lord, today for our strength that, you're, that flows from you. We thank you, Lord, for the faithful people, for the heart that you have given them to serve you. We thank you, Lord, that you see our seed and you see our heart and you see the work that we are doing in the pandemic. We thank you, Lord, that you are walking among us. You are keeping us whole. You are keeping us fresh. And you are preparing our hearts for the next season that comes with this harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give Jesus a big hand clap of praise today. He's worthy to be praised. Come on, he's a great God. And greatly to be praised. I didn't say a golf clap. I said he's a great God, and he's greatly, greatly to be praised. Thank you, Matthew. That's so good. There's so many things you can't control, but the one thing you can control is seed, time, and harvest. Amen. Thank you for your partnership, all of our Surge partners. For those of you who are giving in person, online, we thank you for your continued support as we continue to move forward with the ministry of Surge Church. And we pray God's blessings on your lives, your businesses, your careers, your family, your children. Amen. The blessing of the Lord extends to so many areas of our lives. Thank you, Surge Worship, for the powerful, anointed worship today for bringing us into the presence of of God. Amen. We need some excited people in the house today. Praise God. Need to be excited about the Lord, excited to be in the house of God. God is good, isn't he? I hope you've been being I hope you have been blessed by the message series that we've been teaching and preaching over the last several weeks. Where are we reading the signs of the times? Where are we? You know, when you look at 2020, it's left a lot of people thinking, "Good Lord, this is a head scratcher. Just just been some events that have been so unforeseen, and they're also just you really almost don't even have a point of reference for. But you know what? The Bible gives us a point of reference for everything that we see. You know, when the world is shocked by events, you and I should not think it's strange because God has already given us the answer. But as believers, we have to know the word in order to know where we are. Come on. Amen. You got to know the word to know where we are. And so that's why we've been teaching this series of messages because we want you to know the word. And there's so much in the Bible that your average Christian doesn't even know. And that's why here at Surge Church, we want to always teach you, inform you, encourage you, build your faith with the knowledge of God's word. And so we uh, are just want to give you the word of God as a way of giving you the compass to help us navigate through moments and seasons like these. And so I want us to pick up in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And this is uh, picking up from where we left off last week. This is a, an amazing vision. Remember, Revelation is an extension of the book of Daniel. And Revelation 13 is an extension of the vision that God gave Daniel. And Daniel chapter 7, we see that he gives it to, to John as well. And so we see that it's, it's the same vision but where Daniel saw four beasts, God gives John the same vision of these four elements in one beast. And it says this, Revelation 13, 1 through 5, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. 
One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshiped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months, which is three and a half years. So we know that the tribulation is a seven-year period of time marked by two, three and one-half-year periods. So I pray that, that, as we said, you've been blessed by these messages because we really want you to understand where we are prophetically during this time and also even more than that, to have a discernment to be able to read the signs of the times and read the things that the Bible predicts is going to happen in the end. In our last message last week, we talked about the fact that there is the technology of the beast, the the Antichrist, will use modern technology to have control over the world, and this modern technology is going to give him a pseudo-omniscience. Remember, he's going to be worshipped as a god, even though he isn't god, and God is omniscient, but technology and the surveillance state and the tracking of people will give him this pseudo-omniscience. And so we were pointing out that modern technology is developing at such a crazy pace today that it's actually the matrix that is needed to uh, fulfill what the Bible predicts in the book of Revelation about technology and the, the Antichrist's use of it is already here in place. I don't mean to scare you, but the fact is we already know we're being watched and tracked every day of our lives so much more than we even realize it. It's just the truth, but we're not going to go back to that. You can go back and listen to that on the podcast or go to our YouTube channel, our website, and watch last week's message. But this kind of technology is going to give him an ability to control the whole world. And I want to highlight today uh, another sign that Christians need to pay close attention to as we're entering these, the last hours of the end times, and that is this, the rise of witchcraft. We've got to realize that when we see the rise of witchcraft in society, there is coming the rise of the lawless one. There's coming the man of sin. The coming Antichrist, he's actually called and referred to in Scripture as the man of sin. He will be a counterfeit Messiah to the world. He will appear to be a man of peace. He's going to be a man with all the answers and solutions. And he's going to be one of the most eloquent and yet deceptive leaders of all times. You know, I'd rather somebody just tell me the blunt, honest truth than give me a persuasive lie. But he is going to be one of those guys that has the slickest tongue of all. He's going to be so eloquent. He's going to be able to package the lie with such eloquence and power that the world will fall under the shadow and the spirit of his deception. His ability to mesmerize the masses, draw God-like worship, will be done through the power of Satan, will be done through the power of witchcraft. Notice what we just read in John, where he describes the rising of the beast out of the sea to assume global dominance over the world. He said the dragon, which we know is Satan, will give him the power. He's going to give the beast the power. He's going to give the beast his authority. And the Bible says the dragon's going to give the beast his throne. The throne that the scripture is referring to, some people might say, I didn't know Satan had a throne. It's a metaphor for the authority that Adam gave to Satan in the beginning when Adam subjugated his authority over the world. When he sinned, he subjugated that authority to Satan, and Satan became the God of this world. And from the time of Adam to this very day, Satan has still reigned as the God of this world. Even when Jesus came the first time, he did not come to break up Satan's kingdom. He came to rescue people from that kingdom. You can say amen. You ought to say amen. You ought to be excited for what God's done for you. And I know some of you people. You ought to be really excited. You should have jumped and ran around the building when I said that right here. I know where you come from. (laughs) Listen, 
But when Jesus comes back, he came the first time as a suffering servant to pay the penalty of man's sin, to rescue us from the bondage of sin. But when he comes in the second coming at the end of the tribulation, he is going to defeat the Antichrist, and finally, he will no longer be the God of this world. He will break up his kingdom, and the Lord will establish his own kingdom for a thousand years. (laughs) Praise God. That's why, you know, Jesus is like the Terminator, or whatever the, I'll be back. Come on, somebody. He'll be back. And when he comes back, Satan knows that it's over for him. Come on, amen? So Satan's the god of this world. It will be through this satanic power and authority that the beast will assume Satan's throne and seize power over the world. Therefore, we can see, when we see the rise of witchcraft in the world, church, we got to know that the last days are more apparent. So to un- better understand this real quickly, I want to just describe to you today and give you some deeper understanding of what witchcraft is in itself. You know, Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of rebels. You better always be careful around rebellious spirits. I want to carry, encourage you right now as your pastor, when you go to work and you find rebellious employees, don't let their spirit and their talk Get on you or you'll become a rebellious spirit, right? You're going to cancel your own promotion with your words. You're going to cancel your own promotion with your talk. When you're at church, where you're anywhere you are in in life, because rebellion is at every level of society, when you get around people that are complaining spirits and they get around people that are just, they're talkers, you got to be careful or a rebellious spirit will start start working in you because Satan is the original rebel, Right? And so we see that his kingdom is a kingdom of rebels. It's a confederation of fallen angels who were cast out of heaven in a rebellion against God, which Lucifer led, and he was cast out with one-third, and he became Satan. And together with their cohorts, which are the demonic spirits of the earth, they consist of a rebellious hierarchy that's held sway over nations and governments and people. Now, there's a difference between a fallen angel and a demonic spirit, but in this message today, I don't have time to go there, but we've done teaching on that on the past, and maybe we'll come back in the future and do more teaching for people that are here that are newer. Maybe you never heard that before, but there are a difference between fallen angels and demonic spirits. Demonic spirits are earthbound spirits, but the fallen angels are the princes and the powers of the air, right? And so together with the fallen angels and the demonic spirits of the earth, they have this this, con- the, this confederation of rebellious spirits, they're an abomination, and they are in absolute rebellion against God, and they're always leading people away from worshiping the one true and living God. And the pagan gods of this world, in all their various forms, and all their various symbols and imagery, all represent, from various cultures, they still represent the same fallen entities, and we know that the way to contact these rebellious fallen entities is through witchcraft. Come on, somebody. The way you contact these fallen entities is through witchcraft, right? And so we see that on a more basic level, when you, when you look at primitive societies today around the world, who is the most influential individual in those communities? Witch doctors. Witch doctors are the most influential individuals in their communities, in primitive societies. They hold sway over people, their influence. People think, oh, that's crazy. That's just a bunch of myths. But I want to tell you right now, the curses and spells are real. We've ministered to people in India that priests, Hindu priests, have put curses and spells on. One was a young lady uh, who was in a, bound to a wheelchair who had once been a vibrant, healthy young lady. But her family's, her dad's business had become successful, and he didn't give the kind of money to the priest that they thought he should give, and they put a spell on his daughter, and it had bound her in a wheelchair. People think that's just crazy talk. I'm telling you, it's real. It's real, and that's the kind of power that the Antichrist is going to use to reign over the earth. Remember Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, the kind of power he held over the Samaritans, but the Bible said Philip the evangelist went and ministered there, and miracles and signs and wonders came, and it broke the hold of Simon the sorcerer over the people. Then Peter and John went later to pray for them to receive the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. And they began to receive the Spirit of God, began to pray in the Spirit, and when Simon saw that, 
but he wanted to buy the power for himself, and they cast a judgment on him. The man who had cast spells, come on, when he came up against the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the spell bounced back on him. Come on, somebody. But the key to understanding witchcraft is found in this spirit of rebellion. There is a direct link between the two. There's a direct connection between rebellion and witchcraft. And it has a subtle way of entering our lives, even for us as believers. Come on, somebody. Remember King Saul, 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 23. The prophet Samuel says this to him, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. Remember, when Saul, he disobeyed God's command. He, was, he had been rebelling against God. He disobeyed what God had commanded him to do. And the Lord sent prophet Samuel and said, this is the final straw for you today. The kingdom of Israel is being torn and ripped away from your hands. My goodness. God was angry with Saul's persistent Rebellion, that is why you must confront rebellion in your heart, rebellion in your home, rebellion in your children. Because it is a direct link to witchcraft. Notice what God said to Saul regarding his rebellion and his stubbornness. He said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now that's huge. And stubbornness as idolatry. What's he saying? He's saying this, rebellion is akin to witchcraft and stubbornness is akin to idolatry. You know, we're talking about witchcraft today, not idolatry, but I heard a man say one time that, that men, stubborn men, make idols of their own opinions. I think we're living in a day and an age where you scroll through social media, you'll see the stubbornness of people who've made their own opinions their idols. But I'm going to stay focused on witchcraft today, and the key to it and the root of it is rebellion. Rebellion is the root of witchcraft. The Bible prophesies that the Antichrist will come and he's going to speak great blasphemies. What is that? That is a sign of his rebellious spirit against God. Are you guys with me this morning? Wherever there is rebellion, you can bet the spirit of witchcraft is present. I'm going to say it again. Wherever there is rebellion, bet that the spirit of witchcraft is present. This is why the power of witchcraft is uh, is so much more deceptively subtle than what most people and even Christians realize. Rebellion rejects God's legitimate authority and seeks to place, replace it with an illegitimate authority. The illegitimate authority must be supported by an illegitimate power, and that illegitimate power is the power of witchcraft. An individual cannot be involved in a rebellious spirit and avoid witchcraft. I'm going to say that again. That's not a place to clap or say amen. It is a place to make a mental and spiritual note that a person cannot be involved in a rebellious spirit and think that they can avoid a spirit of witchcraft. But I will take that amen, though. <laughs> Why? Because it's cause and effect. One leads to the other. Let me give you an example again of Saul. After his rebellion forced God to strip the kingdom from him, he started spiraling downward out of control. And then where do we find him in just a couple chapters later consorting with the witch of Endor? Right? Right? Now, this is the king who did what God said. He banished witches from Israel. He had banished them. But now we find only to be seeking the assistance of a witch to help him in his final hours and seasons of life because he had lost his way. Come on, somebody. Come on. Amen. I know this is not a, a shout and, and a hoop and a holler message, but I want to tell you right now, it's tight, but it's right. And there's so much rebellion in our society today, the rebellion of authority. The rebe you better watch out. It's releasing a spirit of witchcraft. You better be careful what you align yourself with because the root of rebellion is there. You see, we think witchcraft, we, we often think of the occult, right? We think of cultic type groups. That's the fruit of witchcraft. But the root of witchcraft is that root of rebellion that runs in people. 
So what is witchcraft? The great Bible teacher and deliverance minister, Derek Prince, described it this way. This is so good. The attempt to control people in order to force them to do what you want by the use of any spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read that again. The attempt to control people in order to force them to do what you want by the use of any spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. That's witchcraft in and of itself. Well, again, we think of witchcraft, we're thinking witches, and we're thinking covens, and we're thinking, you know, seances. But witchcraft in its base form, its root is rebellion, and what it does in its base form is seek to control people. Don't be that control freak. You seek to control people because what happens is you'll start trying to control them outside of the Holy Spirit. And you, the Holy God doesn't control us. The Spirit of God leads us. He doesn't dominate us. He leads us. And when you have that controlling spirit, that is Satan. Satan wants to control you, right? He wants to manipulate you. God wants to lead you and transform your life from glory to glory, faith to faith. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching good. So when people use a spirit or influence to gain control of, over others, what are they doing? They're now entering into witchcraft. It's not the Holy Spirit, though, that that's, that, that's at work. Here's why. People cannot use the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God uses people. Come on, I'm teaching good. I'm teaching better than you're sitting there today. I'm like, amen. Come on. You can't use the Holy Spirit for your aim. He uses you for the Father's purpose. He uses you. You're his vessel. Right? So when you, you can't use the Holy Spirit. So that's why Christians, God said, hey, you be anointed of the Holy Spirit to go about doing good and be a blessing to others. We've been talking about spiritual gifts on Wednesday night. Why? To be a blessing to the body, for the Spirit of God to use us and speak through us and anoint us to be a blessing. Well, those people said this about me and those people did that about me. That's okay. Just say bye, Felicia. Why? Because when you start, when you see Christians start, I put a curse on them. I pray a curse. You better watch out. You're getting into witchcraft. Vengeance is mine, saith God. It's not yours. You let God handle that. You just keep being a blessing, and the Holy Spirit will use you as a vessel instead of you trying some twisted way to use the Spirit of God against people. Because you know what? He won't do it, and you'll get into a different spirit that will. That's why witchcraft can happen in a real basic way more than we realize without us having to go to a spirit <laughs> seance. Come on. That's good teaching right there, somebody. That's good teaching. So this is what the Antichrist will do on a much grander scale, though. Why? Because he's going to control the whole world. He's going to be the only leader that God will allow for a short period of time to absolutely control the entire globe. And the power that he will need to achieve that will be of the highest level of witchcraft and satanic power that there is. So I want to bring out a couple of points this morning. Number one, witchcraft is a work of the flesh. That's why we have to be careful with it. It's a work of your flesh. It's a work of the flesh of the human nature. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 20 says, right before he read us, the, Paul gives us the fruit of the Spirit, which is the opposite of the works of the flesh, he gives us the works of the flesh. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. Get this, sorcery, which is witchcraft, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies. Notice that. These are the works of the flesh. So what is witchcraft? Witchcraft is a work of the flesh. In a man's fallen nature, there is a desire to control people. There's a desire to control people. Witchcraft operates in every level of society, whether we realize it or not. In this teaching on, uh, in his teaching on witchcraft, Derek Prince, again, he's a phenomenal Bible teacher. He was a great deliverance minister. He pointed out three areas of control of witchcraft. Number one is manipulation. Number two is intimidation. For the third, which is the goal, domination. The goal is domination. Therefore, people 
will use the powers and the forces of manipulation and intimidation to achieve the domination. And it happens in a very basic level. You know, children, if you you just look at the family structure, my goodness, you can see it. Children are born without being taught, but they are master manipulators. Come on, I'm talking to Christian parents. Oh, not my baby. He's an angel. You know what? You need to check yourself or you wreck yourself. I know, he, I know they're your babies, but, you know, one of the things that my dad always did to me, I was always guilty until proven innocent. It wasn't like the justice system today where you're, so, you're innocent until proven guilty. There was no due process. He'd just go ahead and assume that I was guilty, right? And so I, I try to take on that with my kids today. And, you know, they're, they're, uh, <laughs> Slade's always like, but, Dad, so here's what happened. And Sydney's just runs like, no, no, it's okay. I mean, he just, <laughs> the slave at least tries to put up an argument and say, well, how'd you get in detention? It wasn't my fault. <laughs> right? I know, it never was mine either. <laughs> but, you know, kids can manipulate their parents without even being babies. I mean, they're just born. It don't take them long. I remember when it was Slater, or Sydney, or both of them, you know, when they cried, crying through the night in their own room. And the doctor told Mary, he said, look, you're going to have to just let him cry it out and don't go in there. And we, and we, <laughs> we had some nights where she's like, oh, I just, he kept screaming. And the doctor said, look, he's eventually going to wear himself down and, and, go, and fall asleep. And there was a couple nights where she's like, oh, I need to go in there. I'm like, don't, don't. And eventually, three hours later, sorry, I watched a lot of SpongeBob with Sydney. <laughs> he would finally collapse in and, and sheer exhaustion and go to sleep, but it was crying and screaming. We could hear him bouncing in the baby bed, you know, just trying to do anything to get us to come in there and get them. But you have to not let them manipulate you. You have to be the leader. I grew up in church. I have seen it. Listen, this might sound crazy, okay? But, you know, it's coming from me, so. No, listen, I'm, I'm 44, right? So from, I've been in church from zero to 44. I've been in a pastor's family from zero to 44. I have seen almost everything, and every once in a while something new happens. I'm like, wow, I did not see that coming, right? But most of the time I've seen it all, right? And I have seen growing up, I have seen children manipulate their parents to keep them from coming to church, but they go everywhere else. It's like it's, the, 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 in them is... In the, I'm just making an example of there's something in the human nature of people that, that has a, a tool for manipulation. Let me, let me put on a basic level between men and women. What do women and husband, uh, wives often do? They will use manipulation over their husband to get what they want. Come on, ladies, tell me I'm not lying. There's only one. They're like, be quiet. It's been working all these years. It worked for Eve, didn't it? They'll, they'll, they'll throw a fit or they'll do something. No, nothing's wrong. Oh, come on. What's the matter? Not nothing. All right. <laughs> I'm going to, Miss Sheila, what was your words of wisdom counsel to me earlier today is when you're in a hole, quit digging. But what will, what will, what will men do though? I, I, I'm not finished, ladies. Men will use intimidation. Hey! You know, they'll use the bruteness to intimidate in the house to get what they want. But whether it's manipulation or intimidation, it's all about one thing. What? Domination. Right? And my point is, it's embedded in human nature, whether it's male, female, adult, teenager, kid. These things are, don't have to be learned. You don't have to go to school for it. There's something in the fallen nature of man that makes you do that. And that is the thing that Satan exploits to bring about a spirit of rebellion. And once the root is there, then the witchcraft is on its way. Come on, somebody. You're, you're like, I thought you were talking about the Antichrist. I'm getting there. I just want to show you real quickly. You've got to have this basic understanding. James 1.14, he said, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Right? So Satan is just, what is he doing? He's exploiting something that is already there that he will use to, to, to bring you that rebellion out and that manipulation, that intimidation for the purpose of domination. Again, God doesn't dominate people. He leads them. Satan possesses 
God leads. Come on, somebody. So there is within people, even Christians, a desire for power and a desire for knowledge. Satan will use that lust in people for these things as a point of entry. Remember Adam and Eve. What did he say? It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They did not know evil. They had only known good, and God said, don't eat of it. But what did Satan do? He enticed them. He said, there is a secret knowledge that you don't have. If you'll eat this, you'll have that knowledge. He said, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God or like a God. And so it was this idea of gaining knowledge and having power to be God-like. That was the enticement. And here's the sad thing. This is the deception of witchcraft and Satan. They were already made in the image of God. They were already like their creator. But it was the enticement that, hey, here's the knowledge you don't have. It's a knowledge you don't need. But God is somehow keeping you down. He doesn't want you to be like him. And so this will give you the power to be godlike. And that is how they fell. He just enticed them. And I want to tell you, church, today, that this will be the enticing draw of the man who will become the Antichrist. He will, he will, that will be offered to him. Remember when Jesus was offered the nations of the world, if, G, if he would bow down and worship Satan, Jesus said that you're going to worship God and God alone, and he rejected Satan, but the man of sin will take that offer. Number two, witchcraft is a spiritual power. There's a supernatural power to the satanic realm. That's a fact. A supernatural power that is not from God is satanic. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of darkness. And that is why Satan always operates in the shadows of darkness. And that's what makes the power and the influence of witchcraft so subtle. And that's why we have to be careful not to be deceived by the things of this world. We have to have the eyes of the Spirit and the knowledge of God's Word to see through the things of this world and not be swayed by them. So we see that the manifestations of satanic power are going to be on your screen. And this is something that you really need to know. Number one, the satanic power, the manifestations of satanic power is witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. These are the manifestations of satanic power, witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. Witchcraft is the power part of, of satanic power, meaning that it's the spells and it's the curses and those things really are real. They're not, for us in America, we think of them in, in terms of a, uh, of a movie, You're right? Harry Potter. But those things are really real, the spells and the curses. In fact, we have a new life in the Word. It's about to come out, the last teaching on the anointing. And we talk about in this teaching about where witchcraft and sorcery comes from in before the flood, by the fallen angels, how they taught men these things, the release of spells and the reversing of spells. Come on, that's witchcraft. This is the power arm of satanic power. But then there's divination. That's the knowledge part. That's the fortune telling. That is uh, uh, being able to uh, predict future events, not of God, or at least act like you're predicting the future events. Remember the girl in Acts 16? She had the spirit of Python who was becoming a, a, a hindrance to Paul and Barnabas, and Paul just turned right around and rebuked the spirit of Python. She was a slave girl, and she made a lot of money for her masters because she would predict people's future. And so Paul rebuked the spirit out of her, and we see that he got thrown in jail and he was beaten, but come on, in the midnight hour, an earthquake hit the prison, and the church of Philippi was born. Come on, it all started with rebuking the spirit of Python out of this girl. That's a divination. Then you have thirdly, and that's the sorcery. Those are objects like, you know, potions and charms and talismans for good luck. Drugs are also what would be a part of sorcery. Because you'll often find, even in Africa, like the witch doctors will use drugs to put themselves in an altered state. You know, you all know of our travels around the world and our heart for the nations. And if you go into my office, there's a lot of things from around the world. 
And when I'm in Africa, you know, a few years ago, I was wanting to buy some things and I have some cool stuff, but some of the masks, you have to be careful. And there were missionaries were warning me, you be careful with some of these masks that you, that, that, that look cool, but they may have a demonic origin. He said, what happens is the witch doctors will take drugs in the altered state. They'll go into these, you know, like a, like a, a trance like state and the images they see in those trance like states, they will come back and make the mask of things that look similar to isn't it amazing how alien-like those things are? But that's for another subject. <laughs> Everybody's like, I knew you were weird. When I say alien, I mean not of this world, right? Meaning that fallen angels, right? Fallen angels that they contact, right? And they consort with. Come on, this stuff is real. You can think I'm weird or not, but it's real. And it's the same power that we see at work in this world today, it's the same power fueling the spirit of Antichrist. Look in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. This is amazing. I want you to see it in a light. Maybe you've never seen it before. Oh, foolish Galatians. You know, today, unfortunately, we're so PC, we can't tell people the truth. But Paul said, you foolish people. Now, these are his spiritual children. It was an amazing. You always know the truth about you, you always know somebody's real heart when you have to bring a word of correction or a word of rebuke, right? So no, he's bringing a word of rebuke against against them. Oh foolish Galatians, notice the next sentence. Who has what? Bewitched you. Notice he's using a term that describes what? Thank you. Two people are listening right now. Witchcraft. <laughs> I lost some people when I said aliens. I'm sorry. Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly buried among you as crucified. This only did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you're now being made perfect by the flesh? So the, the Galatian believers, they were products of Paul's ministry, yet over time, what happened? They began to stray away from the true gospel. The revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified is the true gospel. I'm going to say it again. The revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified is the, it's the power of the cross. It's not, a, it's not something you can do. It's not of works, lest any man should both boast. It's by faith in the work that Jesus did for you. It's in that revelation that you're born again. And he said, you guys are foolish. You've turned away from the true gospel to another gospel that isn't a gospel to a religion of works, thinking that you can work your way into salvation. And notice what he asked them. Who has bewitched you the word bewitched is a term of witchcraft. He's essentially saying witchcraft has blinded your eyes and obscured the revelation of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the point I want to get to, church. The word bewitched in the Greek is the word vaskania, which means to give someone the evil eye or to cast a spell. Isn't that amazing? The evil eye. Men, we all know that because of the women's power of intimidation. They give you the evil eye. You can be a, you can be a tough guy one moment and be like, oh, wait, and just melt the next when you get the evil eye. I'm finished, ladies. I, I'm really, I should close the service right now. I'm in for it this afternoon. I might call some of you all to come over and hang out. <laughs> I was just using a, a bad example. But notice this, the evil eye. Notice the witchcraft. In other words, Paul's saying, your spiritual eyes have been blinded. You once saw clearly the revelation of the gospel. And he said, how did you receive it? By the working of the flesh or by the hearing of faith? 
You heard it by the hearing of faith. You received it by faith in the revelation. Now you turn it into this works thing. And he said, it's a gospel that's not even a gospel. He said, but you've been bewitched. There's been a spell put on you. And now you, you, you have an evil eye of deception when you used to have the clear spiritual eyes to see the revelation. Come on, are you guys with me this morning? That is so good. What a revelation of that passage. You see, what... It's, it's as if they were under a spell that had been cast on them and they turned from the gospel because now they can no longer see the, the, the true revelation of it because they have the evil eye. Come on. And this is happening today, church. Come on. I want to tell you the truth right now. Is it okay if I tell you the truth right, right now? You want to know the truth right now? There are many people, including Christians, who've become bewitched. A spell has been cast on them by popular culture, by media, by politics, by movements, and by the spirit of this age. They've taken these ideas and these spiritual influences and they've morphed them together in their Christian beliefs, but it's only proving to taint their spirits and obscure their understanding of the true revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ we are to use our spiritual eyes to see beyond the media and to see the spirit at work, to see beyond the politics and see the spirit at work, to see beyond the movements and the popular culture and to see the spirit at work and not be influenced by them. We have to have the eyes of the spirit to see what's at work and have a discernment and not be influenced by the spirit. Because it looks like one thing, but the spirit behind it is another. And you have to have a spirit of discernment. But you won't when you're deceived and the spell has been cast on you. You've become bewitched. You've morphed the gospel into something else that's not a gospel. And now the evil eye of deception has come upon you. Man, I'm preaching good today while you're sitting there. Hope I got the ladies back after all that. Amen. We cannot lose the eyes of the spirit and develop the evil eye that blinds us to the truth. Is it any wonder why Jesus regularly said, he who has a eye to see and an ear to hear, see and hear what the Spirit of God is saying. But once you become bewitched, you won't hear and you won't see. It's the very thing that's going to lead to the mass deception of the end times. i got to hurry. We're getting to, the, we're getting to the Antichrist. Jesus warned us that in the last days, even the elect will be deceived. Why? Because the influence of witchcraft will always bring the evil eye of deception. I'm going to close with the Antichrist. Look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 through 26. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king will arise having fierce features who understand sinister or dark schemes. Or in, in, in other translations, it says dark sentences. His power will be mighty, and not, but it will not be his own power. He will destroy fearfully, and it will, and it will prosper and thrive. He will destroy uh, the mighty and also the holy people. He's talking about the Jewish people. Through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper under his rule again. His deceit to prosper, craft to prosper, meaning that he's going to be so powerfully deceptive with his, with his persuasiveness and his leadership, but in the end, it's really working out a sinister scheme. Right? He will exalt himself in his heart. He will destroy many in their prosperity. He will even rise against the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. So the prophet Daniel, he sees this vision of a future rise of the Antichrist. And there are some statements in here that are so important for us today as we close that I want to point out to you. It's the actual angel Gabriel, the same Gabriel that came to Mary comes to Daniel to describe and give him the meaning of this vision. And Gabriel tells him that this king is going to rise with a fierce countenance. And he's going to be given a power from, from Satan. And he says that he's going to rise when the transgressors have reached their fullness. Do you guys want the truth? Can you handle the truth? Remember the famous line from the, from the movie, you can't handle the truth. I want to know if you can handle the truth today. You really want to know what the Word of God is saying? He said he's going to rise when the transgressors have reached their fullness. The word transgressors in Hebrew is the word pasha, and it means to rebel or to revolt or to riot. 
What are we seeing in the cities of America today? They're burning and destruction and rioting and rebellion and revolting, and it's the spirit of Antichrist who's called the lawless one. He said when the transgressors, the revolters, the rebels, the rioters have reached their fullness, then he will rise. We're seeing it today in our own cities. These people are transgressors. They're fueled by, come on, the lawless one, the spirit of Ant- John already told us the Antichrist is all the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Notice it says that he's gonna know dark sentences and sinister schemes. That means that he's going to have the ability to charm people, but it's with a deception. The schemes and the sentences is referring to his ability to understand what others can't understand, explain what other people can't explain. Remember when Sheba came to Solomon? She wanted to know if he was really as wise as she had heard, but his wisdom did not come from man. His wisdom had come from God, and when she encountered what he... He was able to describe things that other people couldn't describe, to understand things other people couldn't understand. And Sheba fell out and said, the half has not even been told about Solomon. But his power came from the living God, and the Antichrist will have the same ability. He'll have ability to understand things and say things and explain things that no one else has, but it will be from Satan. The counterpart to what Solomon was, it'll be of Satan. His power is given to him. But notice it says they're not just sentences. He's going to understand these things. He said it's dark sentences and sinister schemes, which meaning, it means what? He's given the ability to do this by occult power, witchcraft power. He's a leader fueled by occult power and given satanic anointing to deceive and gain control over others. All right, I'm going to close, I promise. Just give me a couple more minutes. Are you being blessed? This is so good. I'm going to say something else. I don't want you to think it's strange. But I am a history nerd. You already know that. I'm a history nerd. I love history. And I think it's so sad today there's such a warping of history or not even a knowledge of history because if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. Gives you no perspective of the present. But I love the study of history of all kinds. Love World War II. Sydney has become, I don't know, obsessed with World War II studies. We're like, there's other things about history you can study. It's starting to get to me. All right, I mean, come on. But the more I have studied the end times over the last several years, the more intrigued by Hitler and the Nazis I've become. And I don't say that in a weird way, because remember, Apostle John said many antichrists have already come. And when you understand Hitler and the Nazis, they just a bunch of crazies they were driven by the occult you know hitler was recruited by this society called the thule society or the thule however you pronounce it in german and the the leader of this cult group recognized hitler's abilities for persuasion and he began to mentor hitler and do you know what the symbol of the thule society their their symbol was you're not even going to believe it it was the swastika Well, where does the swastika come from? It's an ancient symbol from Hinduism. When I first went to India years ago, I had never been, I want to tell you. We were driving in the neighborhoods and around some of these houses in the walls of their homes, and there was these swastika symbols, and I was like, are they Nazis? I was like freaked out at first. I'm like, my God, there's Nazis here. It's an ancient Hindu symbol, but the Thule Society had adopted it as their symbol. Hitler was influenced by this cult movement and this cult leader who mentored him. And when he started the Nazi party, what was the symbol he used? The, and it went on to become the national symbol of Germany when he took over, right? And what did he do? He had, a, he had like this ability to mesmerize the population, took over the media, took control over all the institutions. So he began to brainwash the public, and they began, he began to mesmerize them by his fiery speeches. Come on, somebody. You see a picture of the Antichrist in him, right? And we see he drew like, he became like a Messiah to the Germans. He, he, he drew like almost godlike worship at the height of his power until they started losing, and they were like, okay, kill him. <laughs> they realized before it was too late that they had believed a lie. And so we see what did Hitler do in his satanic uh, uh, motivation? He killed six million Jews. Isn't it interesting that the word holocaust in Greek is the word burnt offering? 
Can you guys just give me five more minutes? It means burnt offering. Remember, we, we've told you this in the past, that the Bible says salvation's to the Jew first and also to the Greek, right? Reverse that. Persecution's to the Jew first, also to the Gentile, right? So when you see persecution of Jews, Christians better wake up because that spirit's going to come after Christians, come after the church, right? What happened? The Holocaust, which in Greek means burnt offering, he killed 6 million Jews. It was like a satanic tithe because 60 million Gentiles died in World War II. It's so satanic, right? And in, in, in Pergamum, if you go back and read Revelation to the church at Pergamum, he said, I, he said where Satan's throne is, there was an altar to Zeus that was uncovered in the late 1800s by a German, by a German archaeologist. He found it reassembled it and there was a there was a, a museum built for this altar of Zeus in Berlin and do you know the year that it opened it opened in 1933 the same year the Nazis took over the throne of Satan that God talks about in Revelation was in Berlin and when the Nazis made their parade grounds Albert Speer who was the architect he got the idea of the design for the Nazi uh, parade grounds by visiting the throne of Satan, the altar of Zeus. And so watching Hitler walk down those steps is an exact replica of the altar of Zeus. Are you guys with me? I told you I'm a history nerd, but the Bible is a Bible of history. And if you don't know it, not only you are... Well, we repeat the mistakes of the past, but it's the spirits of the past that will come back to live again. What's your point? My point is, what Hitler did to the Jews is going to be so small and insignificant compared to what the Antichrist is going to do when he breaks the covenant with them. My point is simply saying this, that to give you the perspective on the dark forces of witchcraft that's going to drive the Antichrist. Notice that Gabriel explained that the Antichrist, he'll know these dark sentences, and he is going to have a power and a might an ability that's not of his own. It's, a, it's drawn from the occult. It will be through that occult power that the Antichrist will derive his power. Revelation 9, I'm going to close with this. Revelation 9, 20 through 21. It says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. It's talking about idolatry. And notice this, verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders and of their sorceries or of their sexual immorality or their thefts. Notice this, in the beginning of Revelation 9, an angel comes down, unlocks the bottomless pit, and these entities come out and they inflict people for five months. It's a plague on the earth. Then later, God allows, there's four angels locked in chains under the Euphrates River. Again, we've got to go back for a different teaching to explain that. And he, those entities are let out, and they release plagues, and they kill one-third of the world's population. You know, you would think that after we've gone through what we've gone through as a nation, it would bring us to our knees to serve a living God, to repent of our ways and say, God, we're going to... The danger of the new normal coming back is to, is to revert back to a complacent, cold Christianity. But notice this, one-third of the world's population will die in the tribulation just from this chapter, not the other things. And notice what it says, even still, they would not repent of their sorceries and of their witchcraft, meaning the bewitchment is so strong that in the face of mass death, they will still hold on to the sorceries. Come on, somebody. So you say, what does this have to do with us today? This is such a downer. No, I'm just giving you that we're reading the signs. We're just reading the signs. I don't think we're in the very end, but what we've seen in 2020 is a glimpse of what the end will look like. It's a little tiny glimpse into what the end's going to look like. God is giving us a wake-up call for this nation. Come on, church. It's time to quit it with all the weirdness and the... Uh, if we're people of God, then get up, grow up, get over it, ask God to forgive us, whatever it is. Let's serve God together. Let's move the kingdom forward. Get over all the other. Come on. Why? 
Because it's when we see the rise of witchcraft, it's a sign pointing to the end of days when the man of sin will rise. The fact is the number of cults and non-Christian groups are on the rise in America. I promise you I'm closing with this. <laughs> from 19, I heard that, but I'm going to ignore it. Mormons, from 1965 to 2011, they grew by 339%. Jehovah's Witnesses, from 1969 to 2011, they grew by 352%. Atheists, in 1990, there were approximately self-identified atheists in America, 100, 902,000, just under a million. But by 2008, there had grown to 1.5 million. But get this, church, the Wiccans, from 1990 to 2008, the Wiccans, they have grown by 4,275%. It's really having an impact on our young people, on college students, and all that. They're being influenced by the powers of witchcraft, right? Wiccans have grown by 4,275% 4, in that span of time, and that was the, put out in 2008. My point is this. This is the time for us to wake up and be serious. It's not just about skipping through life with a little Christianity. It's about wake up, be serious. The future of our children is at stake. Come on. The future of our nation is at stake. Some people would say, well, America's not the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter. You're an American in the kingdom of God. Therefore, you should push the kingdom of God in America. Well, if this stuff has been predicted to happen, well, you can't stop it. You know what? Jesus said, occupy till I come. That means that we're going to push the kingdom of God and his righteousness and his word to the very end until the rapture of the church. That's why the world hates us. That's why they want to shut us down. That's why they want to tell you quit worshiping. Why? They hate the word of God and the power of the spirit that comes up against the power of the devil. Come on. We need God we need to pray for God to release the anointing of Elijah on his people to be bold. Come on. Not with your opinion of things, but be bold with his opinion, which is God's word, to speak it unapologetically without fear and timidity in the face of Ahab and Jezebel spirits. Come on, we're in a battle over our future, and it's not just a political one. It's the spirits that are work in the political realm, but it's a spiritual battle over the future of our nation. And it's a future of our children. What kind of world will your children and grandchildren inherit? It's time to wake up and be serious. Quit making excuses, and let's be on fire for God, because here's what I believe. We're going to win. God's church is going to win. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I believe on the other side of this, we're going to see a renewal, a, re a restoration. Come on, amen? And, a, and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I refrain from using the word revival because revival has become such a watered-down word that means nothing anymore. Revival. It doesn't even mean anything anymore. I'm talking about renewal and restoration. We talk about revival, but we're praying for revival, but we don't mean it. It's the thing we say. I'm talking about an outpouring of the Spirit that truly revives and renews and restores. I believe it's coming that God's going to get a great victory. And in the, in, in the days ahead, in the years ahead, we're going to see things being restored. We're going to see things being put back in its place like prayer in school. Spirit of God coming up against the spirit of abortion. Come on, somebody. But it takes faithful Christians to get up and be on fire for God and be faithful and to teach their children these things. Amen? Have you been blessed today? You serve a living God. He's going to win. Even Gabriel prophesied of all the things the Antichrist will do. He said, but he will not prevail over the prince of princes. If you believe that, stand up on your feet. Put your hands together for Jesus, who is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. 
He is the prince of princes. And when he returns, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on the earth, above the earth, underneath the earth, that he is Christ the Lord. Even the spirits and the people that don't want to acknowledge that he is Christ will be forced to bow the knee, <laughs> and the Lord's going to be like, say it. Yeah. Say it. I remember when I was a kid, my dad would tickle me and get me down on the floor and tickle me so hard that he was like, say I love so-and-so, and he'd name a girl's name. I'm not going to say it. But then he would tickle you so hard that you'd have to say it. I love so and Say I wet the bed. I'm not saying it. And then but just tickle you so hard. Okay, I wet the bed. But you know what? There's going to be people and spirits that when Jesus comes back and touches down on the Mount of Olives and he goes to the eastern gate and to the city of Jerusalem and sits down on the throne in the temple, there's going to be spirits and knees that don't want to bow, but they're going to be forced to. He's going to be like, say it. Say I'm the king of kings. I want to say it. Say it. You're the king of kings. Say I'm the Lord of lords. Come on. Say it. You've been fighting in war, but say I'm the prince of peace. Amen. If I just had a keyboard right now, well, I'd preach some more, but we're not going to. Amen. I just feel stirred, church. I know we're giving you a lot of information in this series, but you need it. You got to read the signs. The filter that you see through has got to be the lens of God's Word, yeah. not the lens of the media and the lens of things. Because what happens, you'll get bewitched and the evil eye will come on you. Well, I'm a Christian. It don't matter. He was talking to Christians. See, the evil eyes come on you. Now you can't even see the things anymore. We can't be that way. we got to have the eyes of the Spirit to see and ears of the Spirit to hear. Because if you can see it, you'll put your focus to hear what it, where it's coming from. Come on, Father, we just we bless you today. You're an awesome God. We love you so much. We love you so much. Lord, we just lift up our nation to you right now. So much upheaval. But Lord God, you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. You knew the satanic attack that was going to come on the world. You knew the satanic attack that was going to come on our nation to try to thwart and stop your plan. And Father, I thank you right now. There's already, you've already made a way of escape. You've already plotted a course of victory. And we thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. The Lord God, we look around and we see all the chaos and we see all the things and we see plagues and destruction. It looks like the evil one is just has made... He's just been left free to roam and do his will. But God, greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. Lord God, we're not just fighting. Lord, this is not our battle. This is your battle. And as we sang today, the battle belongs to the Lord. Lord God, you're winning a battle that we cannot, even when it seems like it, it's... It, when all this confusion's all around us, I thank you, Lord God, you're winning in ways that we can't even see, but the revelation of it is coming. And God, I pray right now that the enemy's plans, the plans of satanic forces against your church are broken in the name of Jesus. Lord God, the dark schemes and satanic schemes of the evil one that is set against God's people and their families and their children are broken in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you. The name of Jesus is against you. Come on, somebody. Right now, over your life and your family, we declare that the satanic attack and plan of the enemy is broken. The battle is the Lord's. He is the King of Kings. Come on. You are the Lord of Lords. We worship a living God, a God of order, a God of justice. And Lord God, we know that you are the Prince of Princes. That means you are the Prince of Peace. And today we speak peace over this place. We speak peace over these people's lives. God, we speak peace over their children, over their homes, their lives, and peace over our nation. As greater is he that's within us than he that's in this world. Right now, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, for your people to be set on fire for you, that it burns deep in their hearts, burns bright in their lives, 
There's a new fervor and a faithfulness to serve you like never before because the days are dark. But we know, Lord God, we pray that there is coming a victory and a restoration. And, Lord God, things are going to be put back in their place that once were there, that have been taken down. We thank you that abortion is falling in America in Jesus' name. Lord God, we pray that prayer is going to be put back in school. It doesn't even seem possible. But, Lord God, I thank you. You're going to put prayer back in school. Biblical values are going to be restored to our nation and society. God, put a spirit of Elijah in us. Not to speak our opinions boldly. Not to speak what we think boldly. But to speak what you say boldly. To speak your word. There's powers in your word to speak it boldly. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Lord God, we pray a blessing over every person here, spirit, soul, mind, and body, healing and health in their body. Lord God, we need the strength of God. I pray a special heads of protection that no no, no plague, no pestilence comes near us. Oh Lord, we're healthy, we're strong to do what you've called us to do. Our children, Lord God, are strong and will not be tainted by the spirit of this world. In Jesus' name, would you please bow your head and close your eyes. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray it with us today because it's not a matter of just if you were to die tonight, where would you be? It's if you don't die tonight, how are you going to live the next day? How are you going to live? Is it going to be a life that's going to lead to eternity with God or a life that's going to lead to eternal damnation? It's time to serve the Lord and turn your back on sin. If you're here today and you've never prayed this prayer, I want you to pray it with me. If you're watching online, I want you to pray it with me now. See, Father, I believe you sent your son Jesus into the world, that he was born of a virgin. They lived a sinless life that he died for my sins as a sacrifice, that he was buried, and on the third day you raised him from the dead. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and save me, make me new. I commit to turn my back on sin and to live according to your word all the days of my life. And I ask you now to use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time today in faith, would you slip up that hand and let us recognize you? If you're watching online, please go to our website at surgechurch.tv. Go to the I Made a Decision page. Let us know you prayed that prayer so that we can be there to be a part of your spiritual growth and development as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't God good? Can you give him a one more hand clap of praise? He's, a, he's an awesome, mighty, powerful God. We pray you were blessed by the worship and ministry of our Surge experience today. It is our desire to see people experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower them to live life beyond their limits. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing the ministry of Surge Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you soon.